Welcome back to the Mr. I1 YouTube channel. In today's video, I am going to talk about the group known as the Normans and that how that might apply to your Y chromosome DNA testing. What you'll see in this video is that there are far more problems and questions when trying to determine uh, Norman ancestry through Y chromosome DNA testing then there are solutions. But that being said, I'm going to try my best to go over some information that you might find to be useful. So unless you are a noble aristocrat, uh, unless you're some type of Earl who can trace their family line 27 generations back to when William the Conqueror crossed the channel in 1066, it might be difficult for some of you to know for sure if you have Norman ancestry. And even then, even if you are an Earl and you have that paper trail of 27 generations, who's to say that there wasn't some type of non-paternal event during one of those 27 generations? Uh, that being said though, I'm going to talk about uh, various issues regarding trying to determine uh, Norman ancestry. So first, uh, when you hear the word Normans, uh, you are probably going to think about the Northmen that settled in uh, northern France uh, during the Viking Age. And in the year 911, the uh, Duchy of Normandy was ceded to uh, Rollo, who was the leader of the Vikings in that area in the year 911. And over the next 150 years between when Rollo was given that uh, grant of land, it would slowly expand into the area that we know as Normandy today. However, when we talk about the Normans though, we're not talking simply about that group of people a group of Vikings that settled in Normandy, France between uh, sometime during the 800s and 900s uh, before the invasion in 1066. So what are some of the problems or difficulties one might have in trying to determine if they have Norman ancestry? Well, one of the major problems is that DNA testing is illegal in France. Uh, I think France might be the only European country that has still, that has still made uh, DNA testing illegal for genetic genealogy purposes. So that is a huge problem because what that means is the overall amount of Norman samples that we have in the database are few and far between. So if you're trying to find that Norman match uh, on that subclade branch that you share, you're not going to have very good luck in that regard because of this overall low amount of testers in the database. The people that have uh, Y chromosome DNA tested and listed Normandy as their earliest uh, area of origin, I would guess that many of them might be French Canadian, uh, some of them might be American, so they might be uh, later, uh, later uh, immigrants from France to the New World. The exact number of people living in France that have Y chromosome DNA tested, uh, I'm not sure what that number is, but considering it's illegal, I don't think that number is very high. So that is the biggest problem an individual is gonna have when trying to determine if they have Norman ancestry uh, through their Y chromosome patrilineal uh, connections. Another issue that will come up is the Vikings, the Anglo-Danish Vikings, the Hiberno-Norse Vikings that settled in the area in northern France that we know as Normandy. They were not the only uh, Germanic-influenced peoples that had immigrated to there prior. So the Franks uh, actually conquered that area of land in 494 CE. And the Franks would have been carrying a lot of West Germanic 
I want patch the lineal lines. So even if you end up uh, testing positive for I1 and you can trace an ancestor back to Normandy, France, it doesn't necessarily mean that your uh, direct patrilineal ancestor was one of those Hiberno-Norse Anglo-Danish Vikings that settled there around the time of Rollo in the year 911. It could be that you come from a patrilineal line, a Frankish patrilineal line that from uh, the Franks that settled there prior. Between the year 494 CE and the year 911, you have over 400 years for these West Germanic Frankish patrilineal lines to spread across Northern France and Normandy. And many of them, or some of them, would have tested positive for I1 as well uh, in those West Germanic patrilineal lines. And uh, another question you have to ask yourself is uh, how proficient were these Vikings in Normandy going to be over that 150 year period? It's one thing if a group of people have settled somewhere for a thousand years. Uh, when we talk about the origins of haplogroup I1, uh, you know, before their dispersal during the migration period in the Viking Age and during the Iron Age, they spent several thousand years in that Scandinavian core of Sweden and Denmark and Norway. So over thousands of years, you can have many, many proficient patrilineal lines spreading all around. My question is over six or seven generations between the year 911 or even earlier, maybe in the 800s, and when uh, William crossed the channel in 1066, how proficient were these uh, Viking settlers going to be during that, during that time period? Were they going to be the dominant uh, patrilineal lines in that area? Um, that's a question that I have. And then when we're talking about back then, that's over a thousand years ago. So when we're talking about a people that lived over a thousand years ago, what would we expect to see the remnants of their influence a thousand years later? So if we test people in Normandy, France today, what would we expect to see from the people living today, how they would be connected to people that lived over a thousand years ago. So that's another question I have for when to try to determine Norman ancestry. Um, also, another issue is when we're talking about the Norman invasion force in 1066, um, people from Normandy were only about one third of the people in his invading army. So about another third of them were from Brittany. He sought help from the people in Brittany. And another third of them were from the area of Flanders. And back then, the Duchy of Flanders was not what we would think of Belgian Flanders today. It covered a lot of northeastern France. It even covered part of the Netherlands, including Zealand. And it was a much bigger area. So when we, when we think about an invading force of around 10,000 men in the year 1066, and maybe only 3,000, 3,500 of them are from Normandy, including William himself, and then we have around 3,000 from Flanders, another 3,000 from Brittany. When we're looking at that influence later on in England, uh, in Ireland, in Scotland, when we, when we use the, the word Norman, uh, will we just be referring to people from Normandy or will we be referring to people part of the Norman invasion force? So that's another question to think about. And what would be the patrilineal lines, the I-1 patrilineal lines we would expect to see in Flanders and in Brittany? Um, I do think that the Frankish influence in Flanders would have been stronger than it is in Brittany, so I would expect to see some more I-1 uh, patrilineal lines, some West Germanic patrilineal lines in Flanders. Also, let's not forget that in addition to settling in Normandy, the Vikings also raided areas of Flanders. They sailed up and down the Scheldt River, 
Uh, they invaded uh, cities of Ghent and Bruges many times. So you could have a scenario where you have a Danish Viking having an influence in Flanders and then uh, later on with the invasion in 1066 having an influence in um, England. But would you say that that individual is a Norman or that they're from Normandy? No, you might not ever get that connection to Normandy, France. You might not ever find that subclade match. You might not ever get that uh, connection, but I'm sure that individual would have considered themselves a Norman and they would still have had that Viking influence and they still would have been carried, carrying that North Germanic I-1 patrilineal line. Uh, they say that maybe only 35 individuals can reliably be claimed to have been with William that day at Hastings. So out of 10,000 men, and we can only reliably name 35, we're looking at a lot of other men who were not listed in necessarily in that initial invading force, but we would still consider them part of that Norman invasion force into England. And after the victory at Hastings, these individuals from Brittany, from Flanders, from areas of Normandy would have been richly rewarded with lands and titles in the land that they conquered. And I do believe that uh, at the very beginning after the, the, the conquest, uh, many people from Flanders were sent up north to consolidate that victory in Northern England for William. And another issue that comes up when you're trying to trace uh, Norman ancestry is let's say you have a Norman surname, okay? Can we automatically equate uh, surnames with genetics? Um, considering that the Normans were the cultural and political force after 1066 in England, uh, in areas of Ireland and Scotland, and we consider that Norman, that surnames didn't pop up till a few hundred years later for the vast majority of people, you're gonna see people adopting a surname that is has a Norman influence uh, for cultural, political, socio socioeconomic purposes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can claim a patrilineal ancestor generations before directly to Normandy, France. <clears throat> and when we look at the people that, uh, the Vikings that initially uh, uh, settled in Normandy, we're going to see that many of them were Anglo-Danish. So some of them have actually come first from Denmark to England and then settled in Normandy. Others had gone from Norway to Scotland to Ireland to parts of Wales and then settled in Normandy. So it could you could get a scenario where you're adopting a surname uh, a couple hundred years later after the conquest in 1066 and you have a Viking I-1 patrilineal line that you uh, can trace back to Scandinavia and you're pretty sure that you have Viking ancestry. But because you have Viking ancestry and you have a Norman surname, does that mean that you can trace a patrilineal ancestor back to Normandy? Not necessarily, because it could be that your Viking ancestors settled in England, settled in Ireland, settled in Scotland, and then adopted a Norman surname later on. And then when you have uh, other, what we call Norman uh, invasions, like in Ireland, in um, the year 1169, we see that a large proportion of the fighting force that came from Pembrokeshire, Wales, and they would have gone into areas of Ireland. But before that, in, um, before that, uh, Henry I, earlier, in the early 1100s, had sent 2,500 Flemish individuals <coughs> to Pembrokeshire to help uh, control that area of Wales 
that was more difficult for the Norman to keep under control. So how many of these people that we would consider Normans going into Ireland <coughs> could actually trace their original ancestry many generations prior in Normandy, France, and how many of them might have been originally from the area that we would consider Flanders. So when you start to see that you get West Germanic Iowa and Patrilineal lines in Norman invasions, you get Northern Germanic Iowa and Patrilineal lines from Viking invasions earlier, adopting Norman surnames later on, and then you see overall DNA testing is illegal in France, and we have a small number of people that have tested positive claiming Normandy for their earliest country of origin. It gets very complicated for trying to decipher for sure if you actually have direct Norman ancestry to Normandy with those original uh, Viking settlers before the invasions of 1066. <coughs> and then later on, uh, Henry II would kick all of the Flemish out of England. So all of these initial people, 3,000 people that had gone to Pembrokeshire uh, after the invasion of force, many of them were also sent out of England into Scotland. So they're going to be carrying some of these uh, I want patrilineal lines into Scotland as well and adopting some Norman surnames as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can trace their direct patrilineal ancestry to Normandy, France. They say about one third of Scottish people have Flemish ancestry. So it's not just a few people we're talking about. We're looking at a huge influence from the region of Flanders in England, in Ireland, in Scotland. And if you look at it from a geographic situation, it's not that hard to believe. I mean, look how close Flanders is. To England in general. <coughs> and the same thing uh, can be said about the Norman influence in Sicily and southern Italy. So if you say to yourself, hey, you know, I have an Iowan patrilineal line and I can trace my patrilineal ancestry to Sicily or southern Italy, then it must mean that I have original Norman ancestry from Normandy, France. But it's much more complicated than that because there were many different uh, Germanic tribes that had influence in Sicily over the years. And they themselves would have been carrying various I1 patrilineal lines. The Germanic tribe, the Vandals, took control of Sicily in 468 CE. The Ostrogoths conquered Sicily in 491 CE and had control until 535 CE. And then later, when the Normans were trying to consolidate power in Sicily, in southern Italy, they invited people from northern Italy to immigrate there. So now we're going to get people with Lombard influence from the Germanic tribe, the Longobards. They're going to bring Iowa and Patrilineal lines into Sicily, into southern Italy. So you can't just automatically assume because you have an I-1 patrilineal line and you're from Sicily or Southern Italy that it is Norman in origin. Uh, it could be Vandal, it could be Ostrogoth, it could be Longobard. That being said though, I wouldn't completely try to research any genetic Y chromosome patrilineal connections to uh, Normandy. I've seen some instances where it makes perfect sense for that Norman connection. And I just want to go over one example that I found that you can research on your own to see how it makes sense and how it connects. So there is a uh, subclade that is downstream of the major subclade L22 and is downstream of the major subclade uh, P109. So IL22 and IP109, if you go farther downstream, there is a subclade called IY5612. And you can research this subclade on the y pole haplotree, and you can research this subclade on the uh, family tree DNA haplotree, IY5612. And at that subclade, you have a match with VK281 from Z, uh, Zealand, Denmark. So the subclade shows that they have 
a Danish Viking connection from Sealand, Denmark. And this is where family tree DNA and WIFO kind of disagree upon on the year that the subclade is um, based. WIFO has a, a age estimate of 237 BCE and family tree DNA has an age estimate of 264 CE. I tend to go with family tree DNA because they have more samples in their database and I feel the more samples you have, the less variance you have with your age estimates. So Family Tree DNA says this uh, subclade IY5612 has a common patrilineal ancestor that lived around 264 CE in Zeeland, Denmark. So we're not going to be talking about the Franks here because by 264 CE, the Franks were already uh, uh, long out of Scandinavia, long before that, probably during the Iron Age with West Germanic tribes. So we're looking at a North Germanic subclade origin for this branch. Now downstream of IY5612 is a subclade named IY5619. IY5619. And you can research this on the y full haplotree, tree and you can research this on the family tree DNA haplotree. tree. Once again, I'm going to go with the family tree DNA age estimate. Uh, they have 701 CE for when this branch uh, the common patrilineal ancestor lived. So we're looking right around the Viking Age, 700s, 800s, right around the Viking Age is when this common patrilineal ancestor lived. Now here's where it gets very interesting. This subclay branch, IY5619, has two child branches, okay? One of the child branches is found in Normandy, and one of them is found in the UK. And the uh, child branch from France, uh, the person listed their origin as from the village of Plassey in the region of Calvados in uh, Normandy, France. Okay, so we have a direct hit to Normandy, France for this person's earliest country, uh, earliest country of origin. We have a time period of 701 CE for this parent branch for this Norman individual and these UK individuals later on. So when you add all that data together, you have that uh, grandparent branch with a, a connection to a Viking sample, VK281 from New Zealand, Denmark. Then we have a parent branch with an age estimate of around 700 CE. And then we have two child branches, one in Normandy, France, and one in the UK. That's seems to me like pretty clear-cut evidence for a Norman connection to that I1 patrilineal line. Now, I wish it was that easy for everybody who had Norman ancestry. Many of you are gonna have Norman ancestry and you're not gonna be that lucky because like I said, very few people have tested because it's illegal in France. But that's the kind of information you'd wanna be looking at when you look at your Y, uh, your uh, I1 patrilineal ancestors, look at your subclade matches. You know, where do you connect to people? Where do you match to people? Where do you match to ancient DNA samples? So if you're one of those individuals that have just settled on basic Y chromosome testing, hey, I'm haplogroup I1 or I'm IL22, you know, from I have a common ancestor 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago in Sweden, you're not gonna get as uh, intricate, detailed, understanding of the patrilineal migrations of your forefathers unless you do comprehensive SF, SNP testing. And we're still in the infancy of this new science. So as more and more people continue to test, as the testing becomes cheaper and more accessible, as countries start to make it not illegal, hopefully one day, and most men have had their Y chromosome tested, we're gonna get such more finer details regarding these patrilineal connections and it's going, to, we're, it's going to become a lot more clear cut who has that Norman ancestry from Normandy, France, and who else has Norman ancestry associated with the Norman invasions or associated with the Norman culture later on. Thanks for watching.